application to signatures, tightly, a framework and generic transformations. The speaker is Bertram Potrin. Now? Yes. Okay, I'm talking today about identification schemes, about signature schemes and how to build the one from the other. Uh, what I present today is joint work with Mihe Bellari from UCSD and with Douglas Tibilla from McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. So I start with a brief uh, introduction of what signature schemes is. I guess all of you know what this is and we have seen it a couple of times on this conference already. So this is just to fix the syntax. We have a signing algorithm and it outputs a, sig a signature which I denote with sigma. It gets a secret key, a signing key. It gets uh, the verification algorithm is see on this side, it gets a verification key and it gets a signature and it will indicate with a zero or one whether a signature on M is considered valid or not. Uh, everything depends on signature schemes nowadays. Uh, there's uncountable examples, for example, TLS, e-commerce and so on. And uh, signature schemes are also widely standardized. So uh, these two are, for example, RSA-based signatures uh, and these are discrete log-based signatures that uh, appear in the one or the other standard, so this is actually a standard. Um, if we focus at the letter four here, they have something in common, namely at least two of them uh, are, uh, come from the future mere transform of some identification scheme into a signature scheme. So this is a general principle in, in for signatures to, to have a conversion from here to this side. Uh, the future mu transform was, was proposed 86 and it's quite versatile because it takes a, lot, a big class of identification schemes and makes signature schemes out of them. We have signatures based on factoring, on RSA, on discrete logarithm problem, it's, it's all there. And this also holds for the, the very efficient ones that were standardized. So for example, these two uh, are directly instantiations of this and just in a different elliptic, uh, in different uh, discrete logarithm groups. Uh, this one is grayed out because actually yes, DSA and ECDSA are not really from the future mere transform, but, but the same way of thinking behind this. What I put down here on the slide is a, a brief history of the security arguments for future mere transform. Uh, when it was proposed in 86, there was just a hope for, for security. The security was not understood. This started with, uh, with PS in, in uh, 96, 95 about, and then this is the early 2000s. Uh, where the reductions were made to, to the to security properties of ID schemes. And in, in principle, we try to extend here to a, to a fourth bullet point. What's this paper about in this setting? So the future mu transform is there, but it has a big problem somewhat, namely the security reduction is inherently untied. So we always lose a factor a huge factor of 2 to the 60 or something, so this is the number of random oracle queries that we allow. Uh, there is some exceptions though, if you have lossy, lossy identification schemes, but in general we have untightness, and this is due to the forking lemma or the reset lemma, whatever the paper used that you consult, it's uh, very similar. And untight reductions have, in principle, the problem that actually they blow up your key sizes and your signature sizes. If you, unless you disregard uh, tightness completely, but uh, we don't do it for this talk at least. Uh, there is an exception though, there is a, a scheme or a, or a conversion or more scheme, it's called SWAP, this appears in a, in a journal paper of uh, uh, Mikali and Raisin, also in the early 2000s, and that one is factoring based, and it has a tight reduction. However, it does not follow from the future mere transform. 
So this is somewhat the setting that we started with, and then we have the following three contributions. First, we extend the class of uh, identification schemes that can be considered for these tran uh, transformations by adding a, another functionality. This is the ID schemes with treptors, and there is a couple of instantiation for this. The second part is that we then take these uh, class of identification schemes and we propose new transforms that will turn them into, into signature schemes. So this is four new transforms that we propose. Importantly, they are, the reductions in all four cases are tight. And then the third point is we look, go back to the, to the swap scheme and uh, try to re-understand it then in, in that framework. Because so far, swap I consider ad hoc. So, the first step is to look more into the security of signature schemes. So far I gave you the syntax. Uh, security definitions, we also, first of all you know it, and second we just saw it in the last talk. The, the most uh, common uh, security notion is existential unforgeability under chosen message attack, which we denote just with UF. There you have the adversary that needs to forge on any message, and it has an uh, oracle, a signature oracle, that signs any message that it provides. Then there's a second notion, it's a more technical one that we need in this uh, paper. Namely, this is we called unique unforgeability, and it's very similar to standard unforgeability, but there's one exception, namely, the signature oracle can be queried at most once on each message. So the adversary can say, sign the string Alice, but it cannot say the second time, sign the string Alice for me. So that's the only difference. Of course, the second one is more restricted than the first one, so there is an implication from here to this one. Uh, one can also show that this implication is strict. The question is then, sorry, do we have transforms that bring the weak notion to the strong one? And I'm showing two transformations for this on, the, on just the next slide. Importantly, these transforms have tight reductions and because our overall goal is to go from identification schemes to signature schemes, with UF security, then from now on the goal will just be to go from identification to UUF. This will be sufficient because we can then just uh, run one of these transforms afterwards. So how do these two transforms look like? Uh, in principle, both of them can be considered folklore because they appeared somewhere else, but not with a security analysis and import in most, more importantly not with a uh, checking whether the reductions were tight and so on, so I just repeat them here. So the two transforms go into take two very different paths to achieve the goal. The first one, which we call DR, works by removing randomness from the scheme. So this is the standard thing of, of de-randomizing the signing algorithm by deriving the randomness that it will use using a PRF from the message. And because our paper is full of random oracles anyway, we actually write just, we use another random oracle, an independent one of the other one, and, and plug in the signing key of the scheme and the message, and then this is our, our PRF construction. An advantage of this transform is that the signatures stay the same by the format and also the verification, because we just de-randomize the signing algorithms. Uh, algorithm. The disadvantage is that uh, we need one more random oracle. The second technique is adding randomness, and here we just add a salt to the message. So instead of signing a message, what we do is we pick a salt of 160 bits or something, and we concatenate it to the message and uh, sign the whole thing. This does not prevent absolutely that I never sign messages twice, but effectively it does, because if the salt does not repeat, then M concat S will always be different. This will also work. Um, the disadvantage is that the signature will have the, the salt appended, so I need to spend another 160 bits. On the other hand, this is standard model secure, whatever, the, like pick your, pick your choice. I think this one is more interesting because the signatures are, are shorter. Importantly, in both cases, we have to have tight reductions. So from now on, we use UUF as our main goal to, to achieve in our transforms from identification schemes. Identification schemes, what's that? Sli this slide, or a similar one you, I've seen at least twice yesterday in two talks, um, this is the standard uh, syntax of, of identification schemes in uh, decades. Uh, what we do have is we look at this three-move identification scheme. There's one prover here on the left. There's a verifier on the right. The, the three messages are called commitment, challenge, and response, and we denote the commitment with uppercase Y, the challenge with C, and the response uh, with, with a Z. 
the commitment is sampled using a commitment generation algorithm that we denote CMT and it will output the commitment itself that is made public then and it will output some, some state, local state of the prover, little y and this y goes then into the response algorithm that outputs the response given also the challenge contributed by the verifier and then this is the, the protocol how it is generated this, the concatenation of Y, C, and Z, we call the transcript, and that one is verified by the verify in the end. Okay, that's standard. What we want to look at in this uh, talk is also about this identification schemes with Trapto. So what's that? So look here that the commitment currently is generated, the commitment and, and the local state here, the secret state, is, are jointly sampled. In a Trapto commitment, in a Trapto identification scheme, this is replaced. So I go back. This one algorithm is replaced by two. Namely, the first one is one just samples the commitment from the commitment space. So this is not an algorithm. This is just a, a, a set commitment space. And then, given some trapdoor with a special algorithm, one can compute this local state from, from the commitment. So only the prover can do it because the, only the prover has TK. So imagine SK and, and TK being the same thing. This the signing key, uh, the, the identification secret key. The remaining part stays the same here. And what I want from the Trapto property is, well, correctness as before, but also that these values yy uh, generated in, in this new method uh, have the same distribution as the old ones. So that's an identification scheme with Trapto. Now we need uh, security notions for identification schemes. The ones that I propose here are independent of the Trapto property or not. So the standard one, also known since a long time, is, is impersonation resilience. Uh, basically, the adversary tries to impersonate the prover to an honest verifier. So the verifier uh, remains honest. And in such an attack, the adversary gets public information. This would be the public key. Uh, so the, all the information that the verifier has, it gets a transcript oracle that simulates just the honest execution of this protocol, so it generates Y, C, and Z and gives this transcript to the adversary, and a challenge oracle. And in challenge oracle, this is the impersonation step. So in the challenge phase, the prover comes up with any commitment it likes and sends it to the honest verifier, which then samples uniformly at random the challenge, sends it back and expects a good answer for that one that, that verifies correctly. The transcript oracle models passive attacks, so the, the adversary first sits there and, and observes how people are communicating, and well, and then in the end, here shall uh, be achieved the one. This has been uh, formalized in, in this paper by Abdallah et al. Uh, uh, the notion is called impersonation against passive adversaries. Importantly, in that paper, the, there is only one challenge query to be done, so that the adversary can only try once to convince the the verifier. How can we build signatures from this notion? Well, we have the Fiat-Chemir transform. This is also well known. Uh, the reduction is not tight. It loses a, a, a big factor. The question is now, if you, if you lean back a bit and ask yourself, why is it not tight? Then a couple of reasons are there. The first one is a technical one, and the NPA notion is only the single challenge query, which is not helpful. If you would have multiple challenge queries, then uh, the situation would be better here. The second is that the adversary has the free choice of the commitment. So um, in the, if you study the, the um, forking lemma, for example, then you have this structure that the adversary forges, and then you rewind it, and then you run it a second time, but possibly it will forge on a different, using a different commitment, and then you are in trouble. And this also uh, is a route for, for untightness somewhat. The question that we want to ask ourselves here in this, in this paper is, are there alternative security notions for identification schemes that would allow for tight reductions to signature schemes? And we propose some. Actually, we propose four, and we call this is why we call this a, a framework of notions. We call this constraint impersonation because we constrain the adversary in some more or less artificial way. Uh, the four notions are called SIMP, CC, SIMP, CU, SIMP, UC, and SIMP, UU. So this is the four notions. This is the identifiers for the uh, four notions. In our setting, the adversary has again access to the public key. It has access to a transcript oracle, which it, it can ask multiple times to generate fresh transcripts, and it has access to a challenge oracle as before, 
But now the challenge oracle, what it does depends on the exact type that you want to have here. So there's four different challenge oracles that I will tell you how they work in a second. The goal of the adversary is again forging a signature, uh, forging a transcript, sorry. And importantly, in, in this framework, multiple queries are allowed to both oracles. So in the MPA of before, there was only one for the challenge oracle. Now this is unlimited. So now I'll tell you what these combinations, CC, CU, UC, and UU stand for. Uh, they stand for the restrictions that we pose on the commitment and on the challenge. In the, in the attack phase, so in the impersonation phase. So the first letter tells us about the commitment. And a C stands for chosen, chosen by the adversary, and U stands for unchosen by the adversary. So for example, if you look at the case uh, CU, then this means that the commitment is chosen at will by the adversary, but the challenge so the, the, the little c, the challenge, is picked honestly at random. And this notion, SIMCU, is actually exactly like MPA as before, just that we have uh, the unlimited number of challenge queries. The other notions are somewhat, uh, are all new, basically. Now this was likely a bit too abstract. What does it mean to choose by the adversary or reused from an honest transcript? So I'll give you the game definitions here in this slide. Uh, this is the main body, the SIMP experiment. It's, it's uh, as you expect, like key generation of the identification scheme. The adversary is invoked, it gets the public key, and it gets two oracles. The transcript oracle, that's here. Uh, that's common for all the four notions. The transcript oracle generates a transcript, gives the transcript to the adversary. That's fine. And then there is the challenge oracle. And the CU notion, that's the one from before, that is close to IMP. Is, has this challenge oracle here, and you see here that the adversary calls it, but it will specify a commitment, and then a uniform challenge is picked, and then the, ad, the, the oracle returns this partial transcript. So this Y value, this C value, and a place to be filled by the response that the adversary has to output. The adversary can query this many times, so there will be a lot of partial transcript, and it wins, the adversary wins if there is if it can answer any, if it f can fill this gap for any of these partial transcripts. A second one I want to walk you through is the UC notion. In the UC notion, the adversary actually first has to invoke the transcript oracle a couple of times, and this will, this will establish some Y values that are uh, honestly sampled. And then when calling the channel oracle, it just specifies an identifier I here, a counter, this, this I will just point to one of these Y's that were established here, and then that one is used in this transcript that has to be filled. On the other hand, so this means the U, unchosen, stands for the commitment. Uh, the, the challenge, however, this one, is freely picked by the adversary. Well, and uh, then we have the UU and the CC case, and they work as you expect. So here, both of them are sampled honestly, and here, both of them are provided by the adversary. Now we have four notions, and of course there's relations between them, and they are as you might expect. So this one is the strongest one where the adversary picks everything by himself. Uh, this implies this, and it implies this, and these, the, the outer ones see you, and you see independently of each other imply you, you, and they are uh, separated. They are uncomparable. Uncom uh, all the green arrows here, the, the implications mean strict implications. This structure, how they relate to each other will somehow be important for the upcoming slides. So I add this little diamond, which is just this figure rotated by 45 degrees. So this one will stay on the, on the top right corner on, on our slides for now, so that we can refer to it. And now that we have this notion, we can start building signature schemes from it. And for each of these notions, I will give you one construction. The first one is building on CU. CU is the standard one that you know with this impersonation where the prover is, is impersonated by the adversary and the adversary picks any commitment of its choice. The scheme to build the signatures, uh, the, the transform to build a signature scheme from this is the well-known Fiat-Shamir transform. So here you see it. This is, this is standard. There's nothing new. This is the same as in, in 86 basically. What we see, however, is that in a forgery, this structure here, these lines of code, already show that the adversary has free 
free possibilities to pick the commitment. However, with the challenge, it's very limited because it will have to be the output of the random oracle. And this naturally relates to the CU notion where the first the commitment is chosen by the adversary and the other one is not. So for this scheme now, because we have basically the, the multiple challenge queries, we now have this result, a security result, unforgeability tightly reduces to SIMCU. The second scheme, yet this is not too interesting. So this improves on the prior result by giving the right notion for the identification scheme to get tight, tight security. However, it's the same transform as before. Now I give you something new. Now we switch to the UC setting. In the UC setting, the commitment was not chosen at free by the adversary, but the challenge was. So here's the signature scheme, and this, you see this is reflected. Now the commitment comes from a random oracle, so the adversary in a forgery cannot freely pick it. It has to, be co to coincide with the output of the random oracle, but the challenge it can uh, pick as, as it likes. And for this scheme, now against this new notion here on the right, we have again tight security. Here we see an example where only the, this weaker notion, UUF, is, is implied. And naturally, like if you do the exercise, you will see that UF is not implied as a trivial attack against that. So that would be the second scheme here for that one. The third one is for the UU notion. That's, that's the weakest one. Um, we see now that the adversary has, uh, sorry, that the scheme has now one random oracle for the commitment and the second independent random oracle for the challenge. So the adversary, when, when forging, can neither control the one nor control the other. What you see here also is that we have the cuts one bit or, or magic bit, uh, as, it, as I just learned it is called. This is a very short signatures. Again, we get UUF with tight reductions from this notion here. And now we go for the upper notion here, CC. Well, you might wonder why is it actually why isn't it, why is there a point to have something from CC anyway if this is the strongest notion in the first place because we can could just use this or this or this uh, um, transform. Well, the advantage is that the others some of the others use the trapdoor property, which kind of is a restriction on the identification scheme, while this one does not. So for this transform that comes from CC, we we don't use the trapdoor property. Uh, we get longer signatures though. Again, we have tight reduction to the CC property. Well, and that's cool. We have now tight reductions for, so we have tight uh, signature schemes from identification schemes. However, if you just believe it as I said it, uh, then I successfully cheated you because I didn't tell you whether these notions for ID schemes are actually naturally achievable. And there, there I have this slide too about, so how do we, how can we achieve these notions for ID schemes? Well, we have this theorem first. If we look at ID schemes that are honest verify zero knowledge and extractable, and this would be the standard case also in the future mere transform. And we look at some security property of the ID scheme which we call uh, key recovery resilience. That means you give the adversary just a public key and it shall output just a secret key and it doesn't have anything else, no oracle and so on then we get already UC for free. So this one we get for free, and so we get this one. On this side for the CU, however, we lose a factor of QCH. And so overall, the future mere transform, if you start with, for example, a um, DLP-based zero-knowledge proof, we lose exactly the same factor as, as the prior papers. What we are better with is with this and this notion where we, where we don't lose the tightness to the number theoretic assumptions down to. The fourth notion, CC, the one here on the top, recall this, this was the one where the adversary freely chose the commitment and the challenge. And this cannot be achieved in this world which is H, uh, honest verify zero knowledge. Why? Because honest verify zero knowledge means that it's for everybody, it's possible to just simulate transcripts and so this would make it e easy to, to forge one. This does not mean that CC cannot be reached in this setting, is that there is no identification scheme that uh, reaches CC. I give you one here, uh, just what we know is that these identification schemes wouldn't be honest verify zero knowledge. So effectively, I give you some scheme here that reaches SIMC trivially. However, I have to also say there's a limitation in the sense that these identification schemes 
a scheme we constructed using a signature scheme. So actually then the overall construction would be take a signature scheme, build an ID scheme, and you get a signature scheme. Yeah, cool. Um, this is just a construction. This does not mean that any CC identification scheme needs a signature scheme by itself. So this might be replaced by something we can. In practice, however, a standard example for a trapdoor ID scheme, so an ID scheme that has also has a trapdoor and gives you these notions here, is uh, the old one from uh, Guillou Kiscater, which uh, recall this commitment. Usually in Guillou Kiscater, you, call, you compute you sample a lowercase y value from the dan and you raise it to the to the e. E is an RSA exponent. Well, and this is trapdoor because if you know d, you can also go the other way around. You sample this value first, and then you go to to compute this state by raising to the to the d. How much time do I have? One minute. Okay. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk, and I'm not going to talk about, is to recognize web in our constructions. So effectively. If we take the one transform that I proposed uh, to, to turn an identification scheme into a signature scheme, and then I use this technical transform to turn the signature scheme, which was only UUF secure, into a UF, we get this. So this is just a composition of two conversions that I showed you. Swap is this. And the only difference that you see here is that the salt value used for the second transform and the C value, the challenge, used for the first transform is the same. So it's the same value sampled. Uh, beyond that, this is the same thing. So basically, this is an optimization of this. And I think this gives a very clear understanding of, of what the principles behind swap are. If you combine other transforms of us, you get the same result, but better. You get weaker security notions, and you get uh, smaller signatures. So this is just one bit beyond that. So actually, by combining the right things, we get better than swap. And with this, I conclude. Thank you. Uh, do we have short comment or question? Thanks for your talk. Uh, my question is about if you have a trapdoor commitment scheme like this geocascateur, can't you get a tight signature from a Hessian sign construction? Sorry? Hashed well, if, you and have a, if you have a trapdoor, if you have a trapdoor function, I mean you could yes, yes, use hash so and sign and you could get signatures sure. from that. If you have a trapdoor permutation, you can have tight security, tight signatures from that. So this is this but this wouldn't follow this identification, the pass through identification schemes. So this contribution is more about understanding the connections about ID schemes and signatures. It's not in the first place to build in this uh, setting swap in the factoring based setting a new signature scheme like we do, but there's no point in it because other constructions are known since 20 years. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> right, so the, the last uh, paper in this session is how to obtain fully secure preserving automatic signatures from structure preserving ones. And the speaker is Yu Yu Wang. <laughs>